Amen. Are we reasonably happy <clears throat> with what we've discussed so far about the Millerite history with respect to the sequencing of these angels? Anybody have any questions before we move on? Go ahead. So, I'll just my question from here. We have seen that. Can you think? Here? No. It's a midnight cry. Here? So, the midnight cry from the quotation that we read was capable of telling you about the history of the second day in April 19th. Tell you about your present, that the second angel still is running through history and tell you about the future and important move to be made in heaven. So then we pick that logic and went back to 1840, where we saw that 1840 tells you about the history of 1788, that history there. Then 1840 also will tell you about your, your present and your future. So it meets all that criteria of the minor crime message. And therefore, we came to the firm conclusion that 1840 therefore has to be the alarm of the crime. So, now, I'm trying to bring that from that history now, use those two points into our history. <coughs> when you look at 2018, when you're saying our loud cry message came in, in 2018. So before you move on, are you now wanting to see how we applied this in our own history? Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll do that together. Um, <coughs> So I'm just check, trying to see if I can find um, I'm going to have to search for that document afterwards. I can't find it. So I'm thinking the sign of the Lord's I can't hear what you're saying. I'm saying we we parallel the history of the Lord's Tell me what your question is. My question is the Lord of Christ in 250. Can you see the man who performed in the soul at the moment? We haven't read anywhere that it has that, that we have these multiple angels. So what we have to understand, which we haven't quite finished, is what those multiple angels even symbolize, which is part of what the discussion is. What do they actually symbolize, which we haven't quite finished yet. Um, okay, so let's go to... we laid out in the Millerite history. We've got 1840, 1798 and April 1844. Is that what you laid out for us? Yes? So 1840 is the present past and future and it is the midnight cry which um, we'll call the alarm which is what they called it they called it the alarm they didn't give us the date but we're using this structure to determine that it is 1840 so in this history there's 
distress in Europe and this distress in Europe is going to be understood prophetically as Revelation 9 Revelation 9 if we're going to use this model is going to explain 391 years and 15 days plus the 150 years and they're going to use a day for a year to work all of that out and here we've got one day equals one year so if we go with this one understand the past this is the first angel's message so the midnight cry is going to help us to understand the past so just let's explain that what does it mean to understand the past in this context so William Miller made a prediction that in the 12 years Christ is coming Twenty-five years, I've got 1798, this is 1818. It's 20 years into the future when he makes this prediction. So we've got a 20 and then he does a 25. So that prediction that he makes is a theory because no one has ever seen in this world the year the kings go up. So until 1840 when the same principle is used and comes to fulfillment, it becomes a farmer. So the first angel becomes a fact because it helps you to understand the past. So when we talk about understanding the past here, it's to confirm this day for a year principle. So that's the understanding of that. Then it says helps the second angel in the present. So now in the present, it's going to help. It's not going to help the second, it's going to help the first. So how does it help the first? Okay, how it helps the, the first is because you have written the Revelation 9, they use that to predict 1840, and in 1840 there is something currently happening in Europe. And when that comes to fulfillment, it helps the first angel in understanding the present history. So this help that's happening here proves what's, what happened in the past is true. And when that happens in the present, you have an experience as well. So we haven't discussed that, but there's an experience as well that's attached to this cry. So I'm going to put midnight cry has an experience. And in this history, what was this experience? You can answer what, what the experience is? Yeah. It arouses. It awakens. It arouses, it awakens. So tell me historically what happened. It brought the attention of everyone to start uh, considering the principle of one day's question, yeah. What was it, its, its effect, I guess I'm, I'm looking for? What do we mark in 1840? Revelation 10, one foot on the land, one foot on the sea. Yeah, the wind, something widespread. So it becomes a worldwide phenomena. It goes from a singular person to many voices. 
So it has this experience, or it produces the experience where lots of people get involved. Everybody starts saying the same thing. So I just put many voices. What else is happening? They all agree. So there's many voices, there's an agreement, and what else do we know about 1840? It's a glorious manifestation of God's power. So it has all these characteristics about it. Okay, so we've done the past, the present, and then it says it's going to prepare you for the future. So do that one. So William Miller's message, the prediction that was made about 25 years, was pointed to the coming of Christ. Now we want to assume this 1843 is 19th of April. So it helped confirm that if this principle so here has become a fact, therefore William Miller's message is correct. So it helps people to understand that the future which is being predicted is a correct a sure event. So the preparation is <coughs> that we're now sure, but it's, it, that has similar characteristics here. I want to know how it prepares you. Have we got a way of explaining how it prepares you? So no one can hear you at the back. We read about the 216 writing. It says that prayers has to receive the first thing. So what's this going to do? What angel is going to come here? Second angel. Okay, so we for sure it's going to help us to prepare for the second. Anything else so we can conceptualize that this is going to prepare us for this event? It gives you an experience that will help you stand in that disappointing moment. So there's going to be a move here in heaven. Oh, do we agree with that? There's going to be a move in heaven in April 1844. Something's going to happen in heaven, and it's going to prepare you for that movement that's going to happen in 18 in April 1844. And what is the movement that's going to happen in April 1844? What's going to happen in heaven? God, Jesus, is going to call up one of his angels and do what? It's going to give him a mission, give him a scroll or a parchment, I can't remember what it says about the second. He's going to give him some information that says, go and speak to these people. So the preparation, um, even though we've got the bridegroom, it's not really the bridegroom that it's going to prepare you for. It's going to prepare you to receive the second angel's message. So that's what we want to we want to see. So in that history, so I'm going to take the bridegroom out. What would we expect to see if this story is going to prepare you for the second angel's message? What I want to factor in is we've got 1840, but when we do this, we just said summer. And I wanted to use summer in a loose way. And I want to use 1840 in a loose way now. How would we use that in a loose way? What, how would we symbolize that to make it loose? I want to use this concept that we have here. What did we mark? That gives us a period of time. 
the foundations. So normally we mark 42 here. But I want to mark it as the foundations. So I'm saying all of this history is the midnight cry. If this all becomes the midnight cry, it has the identical structure that we've got here. Because even though we say the midnight cry is in the summer, it goes all the way to the end. Sorry? The history of the midnight cry. From there, that's the history of the midnight cry. And the reason I want to see that, why do you want to see that, Sister Emma? Why don't we want to make it a point? Why do we want to make it a period of time? In this period of time, what is this cry doing? The third bit of it. The third part of the midnight cry. What is the third part? Prepare them for the future. What is the future? Okay, so how does it prepare them in this history for that? I'm asking for a specific reason. You forgot. Anyone? What's going to happen in this history? Someone's going to be raised up. Not Foy. Not Snow. Who? And what's Fitch going to do, Sister Emma? Which is? So, in this history, light's going to be given on the second angel because Fitch is going to do a series, I think. Series of sermons. Is it six? Or is it just one article? So he's going to do an article on the second angel's message. Do you have the reference? So I've, I've always wondered, what is Fitch doing, talking about the second angel before the arrival of the second angel? Why is he doing that? What role does it serve? So I want to suggest now, based upon this structure of this midnight cry, what his role is, he's the person that's going to prepare you for the second angel, if we're okay with that principle. I don't know if you can uh, assent to that. I don't know if you've ever known that he actually did a... You, you found it? Just a reference. 1843 CF. CHMP. 3.1. And it's only this one article that he does? Yeah, is that right? Just this one article. So... Explain that, Brother Rogers. You've done the... Understand the past. The present... I would say the present is the experience that you're currently having confirms everything, and now the preparation. So, Fitch is preparing, is, pre, is preparing them to receive the second angel. So, I don't know what we think about that. I don't know if you... Did everybody know that Fitch did a presentation on the second angel? before the arrival of the second angel. I've never been able to explain why or what that means, I've, so I've always ignored it. Um, but if this is correct, I think we have a, a logic that shows why he has to do that, what his role is. So he's part of the midnight cry message in this history, this four year history. Um, anybody got thoughts on the chart, 42? What was 42 got to do with preparing you? What, 
what does 40 do, 42 do for this movement? Brother William. What purpose does it serve? What role does it serve? I think the way it prepares them for the future is that in the 18, it is the 1842 chart, but whatever is contained there is pointing them to 1843. So we'll go with that initial logic. It's, it's the 1842 chart that points you to 43. If it points you there, that is exactly the same imagery that we've got. It's preparing you for 1843. Are we okay with that? Okay, so... I'm going to put this here, 42. So 42, it's the 1842 chart that's going to prepare you for 1843. Sorry? I'm seeing the book where we can find the church. Oh, okay. Let me... Um, so this is going to prepare you for 1843 because it points to it and it's called the 1843 chart, not the 1842 chart because it's pointing you or preparing you to do that. And the reference? Yes. <coughs> BP? 52.3. And what is that, BP? Joseph Bates. Joseph Bates, okay. So this is this is by Joseph Bates, and what's oh Charles Fitch? I don't know what's it. It's probably some article, uh, periodical or something. Okay, so we can do forty-two, and we can do Fitch. So now we can factor both of those in. Um, anything else about the forty-two chart? What else do we know about the forty-two chart? I like that. It's called the forty-three because it's preparing you for forty-three. Any other thoughts? How many? Number. Yeah, what number? 300. So I like that. So we've got 300. So we know that there are 300 charts that are produced. Are you okay with that, Brother Brian? 300 charts to produce. Why do we want to make that point? Why is that important? What did you ask a minute ago? Which year? So, what's the connection? What is 1850? Of that chart. How many charts were produced? In 1850. Have a guess. Have a guess. 300. They produce 300 1850 charts. They actually want to produce less, but they end up producing the 300. They do some commercial deal and 300 is the number that they're going to go for. So you've got a hard connection between the 43 chart and the 50 chart by the number 300. Why do we pick 300, uh, Brother Andrew? 300. What do you know about 300? Nothing about 300? No stories, nothing? Okay, you do know, but you've just forgotten. Uh, Brother Benjamin? I, will, I want to go for uh, which 3,000? 3,000 Pentecost. Brother, back. Yeah, but I'm looking for a, the symbology, some story that we can, even if we don't do anything, that we can put onto this. Gideon. So we've got Gideon. My brother, at the back, another 300. Sorry? You would have thought Gideon. Do you know another 300?
Tell me which, okay. Which book is that found in? Daniel. Daniel chapter 11. So we've got 300 Spartans. And you said that's Daniel 11. Two? Daniel chapter 11, verse 2. Um, my brother, what other book? Bible book. God, don't do that. Do that. Book of Esther, chapter. Chapter. So this one's a bit tricky. I'm going to say it's between one and two, and it's actually in the middle. If we want to do the, if we want to actually pick up the three hundred, brother William, what battle is this? What battle is Spartans? Thermopylae. Everybody okay with that? So, if you're not familiar with that history, have a look. It's the Battle of Thermopylae. Uh, so we've got 300 connected with Gideon, connected with the Spartans. Um, the Gideon ones, I guess, is more obvious because you have this continual reduction of men until you get to the 300 who are qualified to do that work. Brother Andrew, you knew about the Gideons? 300, well, you, knew, you knew that. Did you know about the Spartan? You, you didn't know about that. Brother Paul? So I want to add that, another 300. Oh good, another 300. 300 foxes, Samson. 300 foxes, good. That's the one that gets forgotten a lot. There's 300 foxes, and this is Samson, the book of Samson. Three? Yeah, not really book of Samson. <laughs> okay. So wind back is where I want to teach. Here. Yeah. We have our natural and the second angel. But according to each psalm, it's going to divide it into three sections. Okay. So the first one is going to say that Babylon is the Antichrist. Then the second section is going to deal with Revelation 18, verse 2. Then the third section is going to deal with Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. So, how. Can you teach us something? Because first is going to deal with the battle of the Antichrist, the second is going to deal with Revelation 18 verse 2, then the third section is going to deal with Revelation 18 verse 4. I'm, I'm going to avoid answering your question unless someone's got some thoughts on it. Um, if we looked at his article, we could, we could spend a lot of time doing that. What I, what I really wanted to do was to get an overview to try and put in information that we're already familiar with to show that this structure that we have had, past, present and future, is actually true and it helps us to explain some things that maybe we didn't notice before or that we knew but we couldn't explain. So. I'm going, to, I'm going to avoid answering the question to see what the implications of all of that is and just say in a simplistic way, because I want to just do it at this first level, simple, is to say, I'm suggesting that we can put his article in this context with an explanation of what it means. Not the details of what it means, but just prophetically why it has to be there. That he's going to prepare you for what's about to happen. We, we know this is in, what is the date by the way? We didn't put the date. Do we just have that? So we've got 1843, 
1842, what happens? In June, they begin to shut the doors on the movement, which means they begin to fight and resist against the movement. Is this where you have a shut door in this history? We don't really mark that as the shut door. The shut door is going to come here, if you could have used that concept of the shut door. So again, this fight that's happening is preparing you for what's about to come. So he responds, I think the 43 response is based upon the response to the Protestants. And I'm saying, you know, we might go into this and use, do it as a kind of fractal, but at this level, it's preparation, which is information about the arrival of the second angel, because he hasn't come here. If we can see that, then when it comes to this history, the third hasn't arrived in the summer, but it's preparing you for its arrival. And if it's preparing you for its arrival, and we're going to use this logic now, because this argument is now a strong one, so this is going to become the first witness to come back into that witness. Does that make sense? We read it the other way. What's that telling you about the third angel? So the third angel now has to be, I'm going to say be presented in some shape or form, which means it has to come before, because when they shut the door in 42, Fish is saying, Babylon has fallen, you need to start coming out. He's doing that before they're required to, when the second angel begins to do its work. We're using that in the context of preparation, but he was serious about what he was saying. He wasn't saying, um, in two years you need to come out. He's saying you need to come out now. So he's making the second angel a present day experience. Now I know when we've done this in the past, we would do like a one, two, three. And we'd put April 44 as a three, which would be a shut door. And we'd sort of turn, turn that into a fractal. You familiar with that? So I'm not arguing against that, but I'm saying we can see the same scenario in a different way. That the second has already arrived beforehand, because it's supposed to arrive here. Second and second. I'm not trying to make it progression. I'm trying to use the concept of preparation. He hasn't really come, but he's saying it has. If we use that logic as, or that witness and bring it into the history of snow, when Ellen White says the third angel's message arrived in October, like she says, the second angel arrived in April, what are the Millerites saying? When did the second angel arrive? In 43. So therefore we have some kind of license or leeway to say that the third angel came before October. Even, if, even with that spirit of prophecy backing on that. Is that a reasonable approach? Yeah? I think it's reasonable for us. It may not be reasonable for people outside the movement. Because they're going to say, give us a dust, saith the Lord, because they don't like structures. They don't trust in structure. If you, don't, if you don't allow the structure to guide you, you're in trouble. And I want to say this, this is not some weird concept. Ellen White's vision about the narrow path, when you hold on to those cords, what do those cords represent? So, people often say the lines, and I say at a sort of a simple level, yes, you have to trust the lines. So I'm okay with saying that, you have to trust the lines, and we make the application, I think it has some validity there. They're green, green is a symbol of truth or faith. Because you need to you know, have faith what holds those uh, cords up. I want to suggest that those cords are not lines. Those cords are way marks. 
and the path itself that they're walking along is the line. So you need to have some kind of what did you say green, uh, green was? Truth. So you have to hold on to the truth that as you're passing along and these way marks are taking you along this journey you need to believe that they're actually true way marks. You need to have faith that they're true. So I want to suggest that this idea about trusting structure is embedded in the parable of her vision. Because that vision, if she's walking along a path and you have cords dangling down, this is a symbol of what Bible passage? 28 verse, verse 17. Not just verse 10 or 13. Not just line upon line. You have the cords and you have the path. If we were going to do lines, I would suggest that the path itself is the lines. And if the path are the lines, what's that teaching you? You have a single cord for two lines. Isn't that what we, isn't that what we do? Take Daniel 11 verse 40, we have a singular way mark for two separate lines. 1798, 1989. Does that make sense about that imagery? You don't have two separate way marks, they're the same way mark. You have a singular chord, not two chords. Don't laugh, this is not meant to be funny. Tarzan, everybody know who Tarzan is? He's a fictional character of this lost Englishman who was in Africa and he grew up in the jungle. I'm sure everyone knows of Tarzan. Has someone not heard of Tarzan? Wow, well, that's, 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 that's good. That's good. Okay, I'll give a different imagery. You have, I don't know, I just call them monkeys. I don't know if that's an accurate term. How do monkeys travel through the jungle? They get a vine or a cord. And what did they do? They swing from one cord to another. Okay? As these people are walking along the path, are they swinging from one cord to another? Like Tarzan or like these monkeys? Sorry? As they're walking through the path, are they so, like, so they're swinging along these cords, one cord after another? Is that how it works? How does it work? In the vision. In the vision. In the path, they only hold on to the cord so that they don't fall. So the, the cord, everyone's got their own cord. It doesn't quite explain it, but you kind of have this cord that's traveling with you. You hold on to the cord, you're not sort of... That's the imagery I get. If it was cords that are placed there and you hold the cords as you go along, that's good because it tells us that you have to hold on to every cord as you go along. But, if it's one cord for each person and you all travel along that cord, what's that telling you about the cords? That that cord is symbolized in two ways. First of all, that cord is symbolizing different way marks as you go along, which is this thread that I want us to begin to start thinking about. It runs this thread that goes all the way through, if it's a singular chord. If it's multiple chords, you have these multiple way marks. I want us to think about it in both ways. So, the reason why I mentioned all of that is because when we have this argument, <coughs> who wins? Spirit Prophecy quote or the structure? These structures are parables of how to apply inspiration. Her vision was a parable. It was a parable of the line upon line methodology. I think we can make really strong and good arguments. The more you dig into that vision, the more you can see the veracity of this structure that we develop. It's not just you hold on to the cause and you're holding on to lines. It's, it's much more than that. You can see it in all the picture work. So when we say here, that we've got this structure and 
Ellen White says the second angel comes here and the structure says actually it comes before I'm not saying the second angel comes before there are people who have left the movement who try to muddle up these lines and try and make the second angel arrive in 1840 because they want to do stuff I'm not saying that but what I am saying is that when it comes here it's a preparation for the second angel some people explain this in a different way because when we talk about the, the first angel how many how many steps do we mark the, the first angel in two steps we say the arrival and the empowerment yes but there's another way to explain it because you've got the arrival then what formalization, formalization then what <laughs> then the empowerment so you have you can also describe it in three ways and people have tried to do that with these angels and tried to create three steps and when you start doing that what they're going to do is what when you come to the second angel when you come to arrival of formalization empowerment how would they structure that where would the arrival be Arrival of the second angel when they do that. Where would the arrival be? Which way, Mark? No, the arrival of the second angel, where what date would that be? What date would that be? Forty three. He says forty. Because we've gone from two steps to three. So they would mark 1840 as the arrival, then April would be what? The formalization and the summer would be the empowerment. That's how they would do that. Is that correct? So we have to ask ourselves the question, is that correct the way they're structuring this? What I want us to see is that what they're doing here is they've noticed something and they're trying, to, they're trying to explain what they noticed in a way that they're familiar with. So I think what they're trying to do is their best attempt at explaining a phenomena and what have they noticed? The second angel is before April. Their explanation, I'm suggesting, is not correct. It can be explained in a different way. And I want to explain it in this way. That we're marking Fitch with his sermon in 1843. This is a preparation. Now we've marked it here, and I'm saying if you can mark it in 43, you can begin to see, you could begin to mark it in 40. Why could you begin to mark it in 40? What, why is he even saying this? What, what phrase do we use in this history? Someone's doing a work. Who's doing the work here? Someone said? The enemies. This is the work of the enemies. When does the work of the enemies begin? we would normally say 42, June 42 but if you go into these passages here where Ellen White is not using dates or events but she's using symbolic language she's a lot looser a lot more free about the transition points and if you read that especially the Advent Movement illustrated which is what we read you'll see as soon as you get to 1840 what we would mark as 1840 immediately what do you begin to see you begin to see the work of the enemies so you can you can make an argument that the work of the enemies begins here if they're enemies of God which kingdom must they be in it must be Satan's kingdom which is Babylon so you can mark that it is Babylon here which is why these brethren would mark 40 April and the summer of 44 as the arrival, the formalization and the empowerment 
Does that begin to make sense of the logic that they're using? How do we see the work of the enemies in 1840, my brother? Brother William? I'm not sure, but I'm thinking like when the, the day of principle is confirmed, I don't think they will be that principle. So I'm suggesting we don't have a historical narrative. The hard historical narrative we've got is in 42, um, they shut the door. I don't think they're disfellowshipping in 40. So you, you don't have a historical evidence for that. I gave a different evidence. I think the only thing I can say on that point is when the here they basically is confirmed, majority of the people from the churches are going to believe the leader's message. And therefore that is going to clear hatred from the leadership. And that is going to result in the judgment of the people. 42. 42 is just sort of the, the final straw of what's happened over the last few years. So there's that argument. I used a different argument. I went to the Advent Movement Illustrated, beginning page 240, and the way that vision is portrayed is once you see that these many voices who are leaving this um, so who are now joining with the angel, you begin to see that there's some thrusting and some argumentation going on. We could say, historically it was 1842, but I'm saying in the vision it just does it seamlessly. So I'm saying that work begins after these people join in 1840. Anyone else got a comment? I can argue that uh, the enemies cannot attack something that has not laid already, so it takes time for them to understand. It takes enemies, they have first to be well conversed with what they are attacking. So they cannot just start attacking something that has not spread. So you, the enemies can't attack in a vacuum, something has, has to already have happened. They're attacking the chart, the 42 chart, but this is not the first chart. They've had a series of charts, and who would have started initiating all of this chart stuff? Himes. Himes joined the movement in 39, in December. He begins to do a work of publishing in 40. And part of that publishing work, he's going to, I'm not saying he creates the charts, but he creates this publishing movement which is connected to the charts. So you've got chart making business for two years. 42 is the epitome of this chart and that's when they start attacking and they're shutting the doors. So it has a history. They're not going to do it without something has been set up. They have to shut the door to something. What about 2450 chart when you were situated? The 2450 chart. I don't know. Because Hymes is the one who published that. I'm not sure, I think it's before, but I can't be certain. Uh, Brother Kephas? Oh, a bit louder, different thought? Oh, different thought. On what it, subject? That's in, okay. But the 300. Oh, the 300? Yeah. Now, when you go to the history of it, in the letter of work of the study, you go to the history of it. It's not, it's Gideon. Gideon. Yeah. You have to speak a bit louder. Okay. I can manage. Okay, when we're going to the history of Gideon, we see that there is this other man passed the test by bowing. Okay, and the test was the one that bowed was to be part of the army. And the one that there's a test about how you drink water. Exactly. Okay. So I, I'm, I want to consider the bowing. Can we look at it because we can mark the history of the people, the three hundred men. In the history of the men of God. And can we mark that 
in that line that we that we have drawn there, it's difficult to see plainly how we can work this way. But in the middle, in the issue of the two minute drive, with the issues someone else knows, Sister White is commenting on it on other items, and she says that they were meant that they were bowed. So, can we consider that bowing in regards to what we have been considered in terms of preparation to be able to see the important move that Christ was to take? Okay, so there's some kind of test that's being brought to view yeah. that's 300, how you approach that water yeah. um, in the story of Gideon, yes. which certainly must have some impact here. Yes. We haven't gone into the story of Gideon, we haven't seen how the attrition happens, that um, one group is first scared, and then there's another test, and then you get this final test. So there's a number of tests that are going to be brought to view. So there's, there's, there's a lot of things we can go into to, I'm sure, 100% sure, it would prove what we're saying. So. I think when we are putting the 300 there, those are symbols and we have to apply them by context. If I take them in the context you are applying, it means that the 300 soldiers, when they go to conquer the Midianite, they are giving one voice, the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. These 300 charts is a, is a suggestion to me that the Midianites are proclaiming one message. The Unation are agreeing with that message. You can see at least the professed leaders of the 300 in this system. One voice message <coughs> they're going to war and you said okay while we're here if we want to do do this 300 thing um, I want to look at Spartans what do we know a little bit about Spartans I just want to add another 300. Oh, another 300? <laughs> uh, the, the 300 thing that, that uh, Mary, I mean the oil of Mary was only 300 that uh, Judas wanted to be sold and even to the Ah, that's nice. <laughs> I hadn't noticed that. So we've got 300 pennies, is it? And, then, uh, and this is Mary's oil. And you said you didn't know about any 300s. And you found some. <laughs> yeah, and you found two neat ones. I like those. I hadn't considered those before. Spartans, what do you know about Spartans? They're good warriors, we know that. Say that they defeated the the, the Persian army. Kind of, they actually lost the battle. But they, the army that the king of Persia raised, they created a, a barrier to them because they did not proceed. They eventually do. I mean, they, in a literal battle, they eventually destroy them. Um, sorry. There's a sacrifice. Um, let me do this. G I D. Gideon, it's one voice, and they win. Did they win? I think. And um, they had a test. That bowing test. What about Spartans? So you said they what? They mean a sacrifice. Sacrifice. Because they all die. What else? And they also were betrayed. They were betrayed. Who were they betrayed by? If someone went from their side and went and told Zaxis they were going to take. Not They're betrayed by one of their own. What else? It 
calls the general custom they forced me to them because at that time they were having festivities that did not allow them to participate in. Say that again? I'm saying the reason why they perished is the other Greek tribes refused to send reinforcements because they had a kind of a tradition which did not allow them to go to all that city. So they had no help. They have a, a tradition, a culture that these Greek warriors are trained when they go into training school from their youth um, they're assigned mentors and they're trained to be homosexual I don't know if we know that do we know that? or bisexual and so the reason they're trained to be bisexual is why? Why would they want to train them to be, we'll go with homosexual, why would they want to create that culture in the army? It's to, it's to foster a bond of love and commitment to your fellow soldier. So these warriors, one of the things that made them so good is not just their techniques, the phalanx technique, where they could put all their shields in a certain way, it was also their 100% commitment to their fellow soldiers. They wouldn't run. And the way they fostered this culture is by men basically loving one another to the place where they would die for one another. They would, they would, they would go to the last man, just like you would if someone started attacking your family. You wouldn't just walk away and say, okay, you go ahead. Because of the commitment that you have for your family, you would stand there and defend them to death. So, this, something that's, so we've got the sacrifice that they die, they're betrayed by one of their own, no one's going to help them, and also, there's no rivalry between them, and everyone wants to look out for one another. They're all willing to help each other. I think it's a really important concept if we're going to start thinking about what these 300 mean. Because you're going to see in this history, there's a unified voice. In one story they win, in another one they're betrayed, so they lose. We have to take that. Um, this group are created by going through some tests there's no rivalry between them, no one's going to help them and they have to make this great sacrifice. So there's lots of things we can learn about the 300. To me the one that I like, all of these are good, but I like this one here about when you take this theme that they're homosexual, that they're trained to look out for one another. There's no rivalry between them, there's no hatred. The people you stand next to, you would prepare to die for them because of the great commitment and love you have for them. So I really like that concept. Um, are we okay with this history? Any more thoughts? If we're okay with that, we want to go to the second angel and try and see what we can pick out from that one. We've got quite a lot. Hopefully we'll do it a lot quicker. Once we've got these two, then we can see if we can make some kind of application for our own history. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, the more we explore your truth, the more we realize how little we know. Be with us, guide us and bless us. Bless the food that we're also to eat now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.